unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Beshev. After a long summer break, we are excited to be back with our 10th season of Grant Tamasha. And to kick off our brand new season, we have a very special guest with us on the program today. Lindsay Ford is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia. In this capacity, she serves as the principal advisor to senior leadership at the Pentagon for all policy matters pertaining to this vast region. Chief among her responsibilities, of course, is managing the day-to-day defense relationship with India. Lindsay is no stranger to the world of U.S.-India relations, having worked extensively on this relationship during previous roles at Brookings, the Asia Society Policy Institute, and an earlier stint at the Pentagon between 2009 and 2015. To talk about the next chapter in U.S.-India defense ties, I am pleased to welcome Lindsay to the show for the very first time. Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time. No, and thanks so much for having me. I have been a longtime fan, so it is exciting for me to get to join the podcast. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. I, I, I want to start by taking us way, way, way back to maybe the year 2000 or around there. You know, I think if we went back in a time machine, you and I, and we told officials either in Washington or in New Delhi about the breadth and depth U.S.-India defense collaboration would exhibit in the year 2023, you know, we both both would have been laughed out of the room. Uh, you know, before we get into the, the nitty gritty of what this collaboration looks like, I wonder if you could just reflect uh, for a moment on just the kind of broader state of the U.S.-India defense relationship. You know, for, for those listeners who are maybe uninitiated, how would you characterize where the two countries are today? Thanks, Milan. Yeah, I I think you are right. Um, you know, but it's not just a 20 years ago people might have laughed us out of the room. Uh to be honest, I think 5 years ago, maybe even when I started this job, you know, I I would have gotten the oh sweet young whippersnapper, you just don't quite understand how hard this is going to be. And maybe in some ways, uh, that's actually uh, that's actually an advantage because I do think some of the things that we've gotten done in just the last year, quite frankly, um, would have seemed remarkable to people. And just to give you a few examples of that, looking at the recent engagements between um, Prime Minister Modi and President Biden and some of the things we talked about um, Obviously, some pretty transformative and historic things taking place when it comes to defense industry cooperation. When Secretary Austin was out in India in June, we signed our first defense industry cooperation roadmap. And then during the PM's visit, I think sort of the the signature achievement here um, that really highlights how far we've come is the announcement about cooperation on GE jet engines. Um, On the military to military training and exercise front, we're doing joint exercise Tiger Triumph that involves all three services, obviously ongoing um, cooperation, making the exercise Malabar, something that not only involves the United States and India, but quad countries. We saw this year during Aero India, some of the United States' most advanced air technologies, the B-1, the F-35s coming to India. for that show. Logistics cooperation has been another, I think, signature achievement in the last year. So for the first time, Indian um, shipyards have signed agreements with the United States Navy to allow mid-voyage repairs of U.S. Navy ships in India. And I think you'll see more of that coming. And then finally, emerging domains. So this year, for the first time, the advanced uh, defense domains dialogue, uh, which involves not just cyber and AI policy conversations about defense cooperation, but for the first time, defense space cooperation was launched. So, I mean, that's just a snapshot. It's honestly pretty remarkable. So what does that mean about where we are? I kind of think about where we are as being at a threshold moment in the relationship. I feel like a lot of times people say the word pivot or inflection point. I've written that ad nauseum as a think tanker. So I was trying to think about a way to avoid saying those words. So threshold moment is what I'm going with. Um, And what I mean by that is I think there's a tremendous amount of investment that has been done in this relationship over the last couple of decades that have laid a really solid foundation 
And now we have to think about how we accelerate that and move forward faster, you know, go through the doorway and think about and think about what's next. And I think the key thing that we are trying to do right now is how do you get the rest of your bureaucracies on both sides to believe in the relationship the way that those of us who have believed in this relationship for a long time do. So instead of having a knee-jerk reaction of saying, we could never do that, you say yes. You think about how you turn to each other first. And that's a lot of the work that I think we're doing now um, that will really help streamline and routinize a lot of this cooperation so it's not always as hard or people don't always believe that it has to be as hard as it has been in the past. And and I think we've made a lot of good progress there, but there's a lot more to be done. And um, the basic thesis, I think for me, is we have to do this. It, it's not simply that we want to, but when we talk about the kind of future that the United States sees in the Indo-Pacific and what that looks like, when we talk about the kind of future that I think India is in, growing global power wants for itself, there really isn't a way that we do this without each other. So we've got to figure these things out. So you you, you opened up a number of different lines of inquiry. Let me just start with one of them. As you mentioned, during their historic June 2023 summit, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi celebrated the signing of an MOU between GE and Hindustan Aeronautics Limited for the manufacture of GE jet engines in India. And as many of our listeners would know, the co-development and co-production of defense technologies has been on the U.S.-India bilateral agenda for quite a while now. But, but tell us about how significant this deal is and what might it augur for the future? Thanks. I think it is hard to overstate how significant this is. Um, I don't use the word transformative lightly in this context, but this... Um, this GE deal, and obviously it's it's one between private companies, but the United States has to decide uh, what it is going to approve as a government in terms of the technology transfer. This is the most significant transfer of jet engine technology that the United States government has ever approved to any country. So um, that's huge. And we're talking about, I think, when you look at technology on the defense side, this is some of the crown jewels. The United States has some of the um, most advanced know-how when it comes to jet engine technology in the entire world. And the fact that we are willing to share that with India, I think, says a lot about um, the faith that we have in this defense partnership and how important it is. I would say that um, reaching that decision is something that um, required a lot of hard work by the U.S. bureaucracy, a lot of thinking about how we can be more innovative in approaching these decisions about technology transfer in a way that obviously protects um, U.S. national security interests, but also looks at how we lean forward in investing in defense technology cooperation with our allies and partners. And I think that's something that the administration is trying to do as a whole to make this easier, to make um, our defense industrial base something that is not only more effective, but more integrated with our allies and partners. And, and this GE um, agreement, I think, is, is a great example of that. You know, maybe I should just kind of step back for a second and 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 we could talk about the broader picture again. You know, the inauguration of the initiative on critical and emerging technology or ISET between the US and India back in January of 2023 was widely hailed, I think both inside and outside of government as a kind of breakthrough moment for the two sides. And, you know, as we've gotten to know more about ISET, I think we have this recognition that, look, it's not a single deliverable. It's a broad ranging framework for how the two countries might collaborate on a slew of next generation technologies. Right. So if we just kind of stick in the defense world for a second, tell us a little bit about the defense oriented pieces or elements of ISET that you and your colleagues are, are going to be focused on in the near to medium term. Sure. And I think you're right. I, I said, from our view, is a breakthrough in this relationship. Uh, it's something that gives us an anchor as we look at the U.S.-India partnership. 
to accelerate cooperation across the government in a number of ways. And in a lot of ways, although, you know, it's something new, it's also very logical. Uh, when you look at what makes the United States and India strategically and economically so influential on the global stage right now, the fact that we both have very entrepreneurial, very innovative societies, workforces are some of our greatest strengths. And that's something that we have in common. And so I said, I think is based on the premise that if we look at ways to bring that, bring those strengths together, we can run even faster, even harder. And the goals that we have, the shared interests that we have to think about how to bring public goods more quickly to our own societies and to the Indo-Pacific region is something that ISET can help us do. And on the defense side, I think in looking at where we would fit within ISET, there is similarly a recognition that right now, the typical way that we do research and development acquisition is frankly too slow. This is something that USDOD has recognized for the last several years. Just the research, the acquisition cycle is not keeping pace with the way that the private sector is able to do innovation. And so where in the past defense technology and defense innovation really lived, I think, within fairly narrow silos, that's just not the case anymore. Um, and so the United States has been working through a number of initiatives, um, including things like the Defense Innovation Unit, to look at how we take commercial technologies, dual-use technologies, and bring them more rapidly to our militaries. Increasingly, that's something that we need to do not just in the United States, with, but with our allies and partners. And so how we think about doing that with India in partnership is, is what we're looking at here um, through what we're calling Indus X. Um, the India-U.S. Defense Ecosystem Accelerator. And what we're trying to do is, is focus really on public-private cooperation to allow defense startups in both the United States and India um, to work more closely with defense primes on both sides and also to more quickly scale and bring those technologies into the defense space. What I think you're going to see in the next year or two is a focus really on three areas. So I think creation, collaboration, and capital. Creation, looking at ways that we help defense startups understand the kinds of technologies that are most relevant to the Indian and the US militaries, the kinds of problems that we want to solve. And in the next year, you're going to see IDEX, um, and DIU, our Defense Innovation Unit, working together on joint challenges that will allow both U.S. and Indian startups to compete to solve problems that the U.S. military is saying, these are things that we need technologies for. These are things India needs technologies for. And if you developed these kinds of things, there's a market for these in the defense space. Collaboration, looking at how we help startups and large defense primes create mentor-protege relationships and where there can be more collaboration between them so these startups aren't sort of out on their own figuring out um, how to navigate this landscape. And then finally, capital. And I think a lot of times we've heard from startups in the United States and in India, they have great ideas, but how do they scale them? And so you're going to see, I think, a lot of... Um, firms in the private sector looking at ways that they can set money aside that will help these startups bring their ideas to scale more quickly. And we're also looking at ways that as governments, um, we can make more funding available in the future for U.S. and Indian startups to bring those, uh, to bring those ideas into our systems. I mean, I just want to kind of point out something for our listeners that may not be immediately obvious, which is, you know, one of the reasons I think the U.S.-India crowd has gotten quite worked up over the launch of Indus X, which, as you mentioned, is this kind of defense acceleration ecosystem, is that, you know, uh, if it, if it uh, follows plan, it will be a network of universities, startups, industry, think tanks, meant to facilitate joint defense technology innovation and co-production, which is, I guess, implicitly or maybe explicitly an acknowledgement that, look, there are limits 
to government to government channels. And in, in fact, we need to have, uh, as two countries trying to work together, a platform that's more broad based. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's absolutely fair. Um, there's a lot in X from the beginning. We understood that what needed to be done to help um, startups understand how to navigate the defense industry landscape. A part of that belongs to governments working together. And I think there's great collaboration already going on, again, between IDEX and DIU. But a large part of that is just stuff that government needs to a lot of times get out of the way and create more space for our private sectors to work together. And we need to help our private sectors understand the kinds of things that would be of most interest and utility for governments. And so that's a lot of what we're doing. Just in the last week, for example, um, DOD has participated in two different Indus X workshops. So one of those took place between academic institutions and associations that were looking at how we could expand collaboration in basic research, prototyping in emerging domains, cyber in space, cyber in AI. Um, The other was the first phase of an accelerator program for startups, um, essentially an educational program helping startups understand how do they bring an idea into defense industry uh, and governments on both sides. So there, a lot of that work is underway. And for us, again, I think we're really just identifying the opportunities and the needs, and then we're helping our private sector really do the work that they will do much more effectively and efficiently than we will. So, so let me try to maybe segue this conversation into a slightly different place. You know, over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of talk about the legacy of the Russia-India defense partnership, uh, particularly in the wake, of course, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, India, as you know better than almost anybody, maintains a pretty robust military partnership with Russia, which uh, still remains a key provider of arms imports. But, you know, in in my conversations with U.S. officials, what what they've repeatedly told me is that, look, what we are focused on in government is not necessarily the past but really rather the future trend lines uh, in this relationship and how they might be changing. And so I, I want to put the question to you, Lindsay. You know, how do those trends, trend lines look from your perspective? Thanks. Yeah, we are, I think, focused on the future of this relationship more than the past. And I think the trend lines look pretty positive. If you look at the ways that India has been... Um, diversifying its defense procurement for many years. Uh, CIPRI CIPRI data, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute data, shows that even just in the last five years, um, Russia's share of Indian defense imports fell from 62 to 45 percent. I think that's consistent with what we have seen not just over five years, but probably over 20 years. When it comes to defense sales, Uh, to India from the United States, but increasingly areas that we're looking at co-production, those have also been increasing dramatically over the last 20 years. And it's not just the United States. I think if you look at India's defense relationships with countries like France, Germany, Israel, the ROK, it's pretty clear that India is developing a much more sort of um, balanced set of defense imports and obviously very, very focused right now on what they are doing related to make in India. So we think that where we are headed in terms of defense industry cooperation and the ways in which the United States can support make in India, uh, as well as the ways that we can look at how the United States and India make together is the future of this relationship and that there's a lot of opportunity and upside there. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. 
So I, I have to ask you uh, about the article that sent tongues wagging this past summer, <laughs> uh, that infamous article now by my, my colleague Ashley Tellis in Foreign Affairs on U.S.-India cooperation. And uh, we, we've talked to Ashley on the show about this, but I want to just ask you to reflect on one line in his piece, and I just want to quote from what he said. He wrote, the United States should certainly help India to the degree compatible with American interests but it should harbor no illusions that its support, no matter how generous, will entice India to join it in any military coalition against China, end quote. Um, I'd just love to get your thoughts on that. Um, you know, are there such illusions in the United States uh, within the halls of government? Uh, you know, how do we see the role that India might or might not play in any future contingency uh, in the Indo-Pacific region? We were talking about this, Mellon, right before everybody came on, but as a former think tanker, I miss the days um, when your metric of success was, did you write something provocative enough to get tongues wagging? Because <laughs> now my metric of success is, <laughs> did you say something so entirely bland that no one ever commented on it? <laughs> uh, what, one day I'll look forward to getting to write provocative articles again. Um, <laughs> look, I, I don't have a problem, uh, with Ashley's statement. So of course the United States should help India to a degree that is compatible with American interests. And of, co of course, I assume that India is going to work with the United States to a degree that is compatible with Indian interests. I just think that's, that's the way the world works. And I don't think certainly in any of the conversations that I have in USG circles that anyone is under any illusions about that on either side. I think we're all pretty pragmatic about that. What doesn't worry me about that, I guess, is that I believe that increasingly the way that the United States and India are looking at our strategic interest, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, are very aligned. And that means that there is more space and more opportunity than there ever has been in the past, at least in recent memory, for us to think about the ways that we can work together. Certainly, there are going to be some things where the United States may not have interests that are exactly aligned with India. And in those cases, India may decide to work on certain issues on its own or with other partners vice versa for the United States. And I think that's completely fine. But I don't think that um, saying there are limits to the degree to which, uh, you know, our interests are compatible is a problem, because I think that space is increasingly large. You, you know, you, you mentioned the kind of security framework of the Indo-Pacific, and, 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 and maybe I could ask you about that for a second, because you've talked elsewhere about the fact that the security architecture in the Indo-Pacific is very fluid. There are, are multiple institutions at work. Um, you know, it is in some sense uh, a kind of region where the security architecture is, is quite nascent. And, and, and rapidly changing. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, what the Biden administration has been doing to try and rationalize or to strengthen some of these networks in the region. What does that, you know, the building of this architecture look like? So I think the Biden administration is very focused on how we strengthen security networks in the Indo-Pacific. I would disagree with the fact that the focus has been rationalizing it. I think it's actually fairly intentionally been not trying to over-rationalize Asian security architecture, because when countries try to do that, especially, um, you know, when the United States has maybe in the past attempted to do that, it hasn't worked well. Um, and I think we've learned those lessons. And so right now, I think what the administration is doing is looking at ways that we can strengthen, but also leverage the complementarities between a lot of different types of both formal institutions and more informal kinds of coalitions across the Indo-Pacific region. There have been a lot of success stories there. You can look at the pictures of the Camp David summit 
that President Biden did with Japan and the ROK just recently, the tremendous um, acceleration that you have seen of quad cooperation and, and quad summit meetings under the Biden administration. At the Shangri-La Dialogue in um, June, Secretary Austin not only met trilaterally um, with the United States, Japan, and Australia, as well as Japan and the ROK, but also met for the first time um, with the United States, the Philippines, Japan, and Australia together. So I think we're actually maybe moving away from rationalization in a sense and, and creating um, more ways that we take some of the bilateral cooperation and bring those into multilateral settings. And, and there's been a, a lot of positive progress there. And then I would just say, finally, um, in addition to kind of some of those smaller groupings, I think the administration has been very intentionally trying to continue to work together with ASEAN. Secretary Austin has been to every 8MM Plus meeting and I think will continue in the future. Um, and we've been looking at a variety of ways that we can also take the work that we're doing together with ASEAN and um, amplify that informally in ASEAN plus kind of mechanisms as well. So, you know, you, you mentioned the quad and of course that, that that's uh, always of great interest to people who are observing dynamics in the Indo-Pacific. I, I want to ask you specifically about its agenda for the future. So if you look at the past couple of years, we've seen this grouping focus on vaccine distribution during and after the pandemic on infrastructure uh, investments and trying to enforce high quality standards, on supply chain diversification, among other priorities. But th th these have been three big ones. Um, I want to ask you from your perch at the Pentagon specifically, you know, focus more on the defense and security side of the house. You know, what does the next stage of quad cooperation look like to you? So I think that the quad has very intentionally tried to focus its work on issues that bring public goods to the broader Indo-Pacific region. And I think it will stay focused on that. So the Quad is really has not tried to be, I think, a defense centric or, um, you know, security forward kind of institution. But that doesn't mean in a lot of the work that the Quad is doing in looking at how we bring public goods to the region, that there is not a security component to that. So certainly um, the Quad is looking at cybersecurity. And I think that is something that is a whole of government effort, but has defense implications as well. Um, maritime security is an area of growing focus for the Quad and, and one where I think this kind of whole of government approach and for us in the Pentagon, looking at the ways that defense institutions can support that whole of government work is a, is a great example of where I see more opportunity in the future. So um, the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative was really one of the signature quad deliverables this last year, and I think is going to be an area of growing focus for us in the future. And so IPMDA is a pretty trailblazing initiative. From my perspective, as someone who has um, worked on maritime security in the Indo-Pacific for a very long time, we have talked about the idea of creating um, a, what we would say a common operating picture for allies and partners across the region to help everybody have more transparency and understand what's going on in the maritime domain. That was sort of like a mythical unicorn for a really long time um, that, that people would talk about and you never really thought you'd get there, kind of like how people used to talk about the uh, foundational agreements for the US and India. You know, it was like this aspirational thing that if you ever saw it, it was gonna be amazing. Um, technology has just come a really long way. And so through IPMDA, what we've been able to do is look at really cutting edge technologies, um, how we can leverage satellite data to bring real-time information about what's happening in the maritime domain to partners more quickly, um, and not just what people want you to know that's going on in the maritime domain, but 
how people can have knowledge as well about dark shipping and the folks that things may be doing that they don't want people to know about. And so that's an initiative we launched last year. We've been piloting it in Southeast Asia. I think by the end of this year, you will see that initiative expanded across the region. Um, and again, that's one where it's not just defense. It is defense institutions working with and in support of what broader interagency efforts are underway as well. You know, you've talked about this before in other settings, Lindsay, you know, uh, highlighting the importance of of increased transparency, information sharing when it comes to trying to raise our collective level of awareness about what exactly is taking place in and over the waters of the Indo-Pacific and this new initiative, the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. It's a handful to to say it doesn't exactly roll off the, the tip of the tongue. Uh, is, Neither is, does IPMADA. <laughs> there's no good way to say it. <laughs> um, IPMADA has, has, is, is being institutionalized. But uh, tell us a little bit about the kind of implementation, right? Because I can imagine bringing this kind of transparency forward and elevating it um, uh, is it, it, not uh, uh, uncontroversial, right? And there, there must have been some pushback, some challenges from, from, from moving from kind of the idea in your head to implementation on the ground. Could you tell us a bit about what, kind of what you learned while doing that? Sure. Um, anytime you're starting anything new, um, I think you often learn all the ways that the implementation of it is going to be harder than you expected. Um, that, you know, that's just sort of, especially in government, uh, your, your 101 welcome to working in government. That is certainly true anytime you are trying to start a new initiative that involves not just one country, um, but four, and then involves technology that you are trying to share with a multitude of other countries. So again, the, the basics of IPMDA and what it, what it is right now is we're looking at ways to leverage commercially available uh, radio frequency technology, bring it to partners and allies in real time to integrate into existing platforms they already have and give them a much more comprehensive picture of what is happening in the maritime domain. So I've described this before as imagine what you used to have for MDA is basically the one layer cake that is like what I'm capable of baking for my children for a birthday. And now what we're offering you is this beautiful seven layer cake that came from the bakery and is much tastier and more filling than what I was able to offer on my own. That's basically what we're trying to do with IPMDA. And again, Importantly, um, because this technology is new, it provides countries with the ability to track dark shipping and dark vessels as well, which has been a real problem. I think um, much of what we have been doing in the first year of this initiative is piloting it in a few places and learning lessons learned um, about how we can deliver the capability, not just bilaterally, but you know, leveraging multilateral contexts, fusion centers in the region as well. Um, and then importantly, looking at what kind of training we need to give to countries to help them not just receive this data, but analyze it, understand it, be able to figure out how to action it. That's been a lot of the first year. Once we have, I think, improved our ability to get that under our belt, we're going to be looking at what's next. Um, and how we enable countries to better share that information with each other um, and hopefully increase their capability to move quickly in response to the information that they have. So, Lindsay, I want to bring this conversation to an end by by maybe asking you to, to just reflect on um, on on Lindsay's lessons <laughs> learned. You know, if, if I were at the Pentagon, that would be the, you know, triple L, that would be the acronym. Uh, you know, as we were talking about before we started uh, recording, uh, you, you, you spent your, uh, you've done your fair share uh, of think tankery uh, prior to joining the Pentagon. Um, and who knows what comes next after your government service. Um, and of course, you have worked at the Pentagon before, but now, of course, you're seeing things at a completely different level at a completely different time, frankly, between the US and India. I'd love for you to just kind of uh, tell us about kind of what you've learned um, going from, you know, working for nonprofits outside of government to, to working in the belly of the beast, as it were, you know, what are some of your key takeaways that, that, that you would like 
people who are outside of government, like myself, who 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 have the freedom to to write and to think and to and to throw pot shots uh, on Twitter and, and and blogs and and op-ed pages. You know, what are some of the things that 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 that, that have you've kind of internalized in making this transition? That's a great question. I don't think anybody's actually uh, asked me that before. Um, probably a lot of the best lessons learned there we uh, we have to have over you know cocktails to to really to really get into it. <laughs> but um, what what I would say is um, working inside government requires a degree of um, both realism um, and optimism and how you figure out how to balance those two things that you don't have to care about, quite frankly, when you're outside of government. Um, And so when you're inside government, it's wonderful to get ideas from folks on the outside. And I think we welcome that because quite frankly, um, we don't have a lot of time to sit around thinking about, you know, the big thing that could be next. And so those ideas are great when they come in, but also inside government, it's not just having the idea, it's knowing how to do it. And that is often the hardest thing. It is the hardest thing to get something done, um, figure out how to get the approvals, figure out how to get the money, um, inside government, even more so when you have to do it with another country. And so that realism and pragmatism, those what we often call bureaucratic ninja skills to know how you get it done are so tremendously valuable inside government. But at the same time, you can't afford to become a cynic, especially when you work on this relationship, right? Uh, you never want to be the sort of... Um, you know, gnarly old person sitting in the corner saying, well, I tried that and failed, so you'll never, ever get it done. Um, You have to, I think, with the U.S.-India relationship, maintain a willingness and an openness to be optimistic about pushing the boundaries further than folks have in the past. And so on a daily basis, I think that's really the balance that I'm always trying to strike is how are you thinking about ways to be ambitious, but also making sure that you have a solid sense of how you get it done? You know, it, it reminds me of of the thing that our common friend Tanvi Madan always says about U.S. India relations, right? Which is that they're they're never as great as people say, nor as bad as people make them out to be, right? Which is, you know, um, y- you should be cautious when when you're feeling celebratory, but also not uh, get down on yourself when you when you hit a roadblock or a challenge. And I think that uh, you know provides you with a kind of even keel. As usual, Tommy is right. Um, <laughs> I agree with that statement very much. My guest on the show this week is Lindsay Ford. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia. In that capacity, she serves as the principal advisor to the Pentagon senior leadership on all things related to this vast and increasingly important region. Lindsay, I know you've got a lot going on. You've got a busy fall to prepare for. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Mom. This was great. Grant Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, granttamasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.